Whether it be brought on by severe alcoholism or cancer, liver failure has affected many stars over the years. From a 90s pop rock icon to the man who inspired Paul McCartney to make music, here are the musicians who died from this condition. It's not often that a purveyor of country-tinged soul who had only a sprinkling of R&B hits in the 60s finds his way into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It certainly helps for at least one of those singles to become a crossover pop hit, and it's even more helpful that that single is a massive paradigm-altering song such as When a Man Loves a Woman, which was a number one hit for soul vocalist Percy Sledge in 1966. Sure, Sledge had a fantastic soaring voice, but it was his level of raw emotion that few of his peers could even come close to, elevating the song into an immortal piece of the pop culture canon. The tune remained in the public consciousness for decades after its release, thanks to its being a staple at weddings and in television commercials, and it also boasted an impressive run of appearances on movie soundtracks, most notably the 1994 romantic drama of the same name starring Meg Ryan and Andy Garcia, a box office hit that helped cement the song's status as a modern-day standard. My wife is the most amazing woman. She's got 600 different kinds of smiles. Sledge entered the Rock Hall in 2005, inducted by Rod Stewart, whose own vocal style bears the R&B crooner's unmistakable influence. Sledge battled liver cancer over the last year of his life and passed away in 2015 at the age of 74. New Jersey hard rock outfit Skid Row burst onto the scene in the late 80s, and behind the crystalline voice and flowing blonde locks of frontman Sebastian Bach, they scored a pair of top 10 hits with a power ballad-esque singles 18 in Life and I Remember You. The band failed to sustain their success into the 90s, and when Bach departed in 1996, it took a hiatus for a few years before plugging in a pretty decent facsimile, crystalline-voiced, blonde-locked vocalist Johnny Solinger, who would go on to front the band for close to 15 years. Solinger was fired from the band in 2015, which left him in the position of not having health insurance. In May 2021, he took to Facebook to let fans know that his liver was failing and that it wasn't looking good for him. He wrote, I'm currently under at least seven different medications, and I need to have my abdomen drained of fluid that gets accumulated every couple of days. I've lost a lot of strength and will require physical therapy as well. He further wrote that he was trying to get a fundraiser going to help with his medical bills, but at that point, it was likely too late. Solinger passed away the following month at the age of 55. Skid Row guitarist Dave Sabo paid tribute to his friend on Twitter, writing, A good man with a good soul taken way too soon. Thank you, Johnny, for everything you gave us. It's tough to overstate the influence of 60s rockers The Birds on their contemporaries and the whole of popular music. Very few artists could stake as strong a claim to the actual invention of folk rock. When the band was formed in 1964, none of its members were even proficient on electric instruments, but together they concocted a brew of the acoustic and electric that would prove to be an inspiration to the likes of Bob Dylan and the Beatles. Providing the backbeat for the quintet was drummer Michael Clark, who, unlike the others in the band, was not a songwriter and was at times supplanted by session musicians. His tenure with the Birds lasted only three years, from 1964 to 1967. Nonetheless, Clark held the distinction of being a founding member of one of the most influential groups of the 60s, and his drumming chops were potent enough to earn him post-Birds gigs with the likes of Flying Burrito Brothers and Firefall. In later years, he assembled a new band which bore the name of the Birds, without featuring any of the other original members and he was to have performed with them on New Year's Eve 1993. Unfortunately, that gig instead became a tribute show, as Clark passed away from liver failure just over a week before the date. The collective known as Parliament Funkadelic, headed up by the actual physical embodiment of funk George Clinton, has a sterling legacy as any act in history of popular music. They've given us heaps upon heaps of some of the most rump-shaking tracks of all time, such as Up for the Downstroke, One Nation Under a Groove, and Give Up the Funk, Tear the Roof Off the Sucker, to name just a few. Their indelible sound has been sampled by or otherwise informed some of the greatest hip-hop artists ever, from Digital Underground to Dr. Dre. Key to the outfit's success, the sublime guitar work of Eddie Hazel, who played on nearly all of the group's works, save for a hiatus between 1971 and 1974. When speaking of great blues and funk-inspired guitarists, one could arguably draw a straight line from Jimi Hendrix to Hazel to Prince. For evidence, look no further than the title track to Funkadelic's 1971 LP Maggot Brain. Inspired by Clinton's request to play his guitar as if your mama just died, Hazel's emotional, virtuoso performance was captured in a single take. According to his page on George Clinton's website, Hazel spent the final year of his life destitute after struggling with a drug habit for decades. He passed away from liver failure in 1992, and Maggot Brain, his masterpiece, was played at his funeral. Slayer is one of those bands that pretty much everyone knows, even those who have no interest in metal or any of its countless subgenres. Progenitors of the style known as thrash metal, they quickly established themselves as one of the most brutal, uncompromising, blisteringly aggressive American metal bands of all time. 
They were one of the big four thrash bands of the 80s, the others being Metallica, Megadeth, and Anthrax, but they were more prone than any of their venerable peers to create a sound that seemed like it came quite literally from the depths of hell. For a prime example, check out the tracks Raining Blood and Angel of Death from their iconic Rick Rubin-produced 1986 LP Rain and Blood, both of which were penned by guitarist and founding member Jeff Hanneman. Hanneman's death from alcohol-related cirrhosis that led to liver failure in 2013 came as he was in the hospital recovering from a condition which can only be described as metal as hell. A spider bite had developed into necrostizing fasciitis, a disease that eats away at the flesh. His passing was mourned across the headbanging world. With party deity Andrew W.K. issuing a heartfelt eulogy on Twitter, he wrote, Jeff Hanneman will always be a metal god, a true master. He gave energy and excitement to millions and will continue to. Say what you will about 90s pop rockers Smash Mouth, but it's impossible to argue that the band were anything other than extremely driven, highly successful overachievers. This is particularly true for vocalist Steve Harwell, whose ultra-committed delivery on hits like Walkin' on the Sun and All Star helped propel those tunes to a permanent place in the pop culture lexicon. Despite having very limited musical experience, Harwell was determined to become a rock star, and he certainly achieved that goal, fronting a band that sold over 6 million records in the US and was all over the radio for years following their 1997 debut LP, Fu Shu Meng. Unfortunately, Harwell's final decade was rife with health issues. He suffered from a heart condition known as cardiomyopathy, and also had been diagnosed with the neurological condition Wernicke's encephalopathy, which, according to the National Library of Medicine, affects the central nervous system and can be fatal on its own. He retired from Smash Mouth in 2021 due to those issues, but in 2023 it was his failing liver that caused him to be placed under hospice care at his home in Boise, Idaho. He passed away shortly after his condition was made public, and in a statement, the man's new lead vocalist Zach Goody paid tribute to his predecessor, writing, I love singing these songs every night and carrying on the spirit of rock and roll in front of the best fans in the world. I will continue to try in my own way to honor what Steve and the band have created. David Cassidy burst onto the scene in a way that all but guaranteed that his career would be short-lived. He portrayed Keith Partridge, the teen heartthrob and sometimes lead singer of the Partridge family in the 70s TV series of the same name, and parlayed that success into a brief career as an actual teen pop sensation. While well, he moved a respectable number of records and achieved five top 40 singles, including 1971's Cherish, that phase of his career indeed came to a close after only a few years. While I was walking down the street, the neighbors started booing me. <laughs> booing me! However, against the formidable odds that are usually stacked against former child stars, Cassidy wasn't done. Beginning in the 80s, Cassidy pivoted to theater acting, appearing on Broadway in productions of Blood Brothers and Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. In the 90s, he took over the lead role in EFX at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, personally giving the show an overhaul that propelled it to rave reviews. He took advantage of his newly raised profile to mount a world tour and even secured a new record deal. He remained active in show business until 2017, when he announced that like his mother and grandfather before him, he had been stricken with dementia. And just months later, as a result of a long battle with alcohol dependency, he passed away from liver failure in a Florida hospital. Ray Charles was a singular talent. If James Brown was a godfather of soul, Charles could easily lay claim to being the genre's actual daddy. Blind since childhood, the piano virtuoso and blazingly talented vocalist was scoring R&B hits in the early 50s before the advent of rock and roll. Just a few short years after that genre's rise, Charles broke through to a mainstream audience in a major way with 1959's What I Say, a rollicking fusion of R&B, rock, and gospel that shot to number six on the Billboard chart. In the biography Ray Charles, Man and Music, Paul McCartney recalled the first time he heard the tune. He said, I knew right then and there I wanted to be involved in that kind of music. By the time of his death in June 2004, Charles had been struggling for years to perform, but was on the verge of mounting a tour after undergoing hip replacement surgery. He told the New York Times early that year, I'm going to keep touring, keep performing, it's in my blood, until the good Lord calls my number, that's what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, that number came up sooner than was expected. His passing from liver failure at the age of 73 left a giant hole in the world of music, but his impact and legacy will undoubtedly live on forever. Drummer Phil Taylor went by the nickname Filthy Animal, and the band he lent his pounding drums to was Filthy Indeed, Motorhead, who had been credited with pioneering speed metal with their special brand of loud, fast, dirty rock and roll. Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich has pointed to the title track of the band's 1979 LP Overkill as a major influence, saying that it, quote, blew his head off. Its blazingly novel sound hinged on the drumming of Taylor, whose double-kick drum on the track likely blew the heads off many other aspiring metalheads. Minus a three-year hiatus between 1984 and 1987, Taylor manned the drums for Motorhead for nearly two decades. 
After being permanently let go in 1992, he struggled to fit in with outfits such as Web of Spider and thrash band Overkill, who had named themselves after the Motorhead album. And after a brain aneurysm that effectively forced his retirement from music, his health began to decline precipitously. He passed away in 2015 from liver failure, prompting Motorhead frontman Lemmy to comment with a characteristically blunt statement. He wrote, I miss him already. It's a shame, man. I think this rock and roll business might be bad for the human life. Oh well. You may not recognize the name of trumpeter Al Hertz unless you were around six or seven decades ago, or if you're from New Orleans. And one of the legends, a living legend here in New Orleans for the national anthem, Al Hurt. In the 50s and 60s, Hurt recorded dozens of records in the Dixieland and jazz styles, even scoring a number 15 pop hit in 1964 with Cotton Candy, and taking home a Grammy for his tune Java that same year. For New Orleans residents, Hurt was nothing less than a beloved symbol of their city. Speaking with the New York Times, clarinetist Pete Fountain, a longtime friend and collaborator, put it this way, When you say Al Hurt, you say New Orleans. When you say New Orleans, you say Al Hurt. We're just lucky enough to be from here. While Hurt was always leery of putting himself in a box, he was best known for his jazz outputs, and while his beefy stature earned him the nickname The Round Mound of Sound, his peerless technique and showmanship ensured that he would be more commonly associated with a different moniker, the King of the Trumpet. Hurt was hospitalized with liver problems in early 1999, and just a week after his discharge, he died of liver failure at the age of 76. Singer-songwriter Terry Stafford was perhaps best known for an achievement that was somehow both dubious and impressive at the same time, landing his lone top 10 hit, Suspicion, in 1964. When did you start singing? Uh, about a year, two years ago, something like that. You've had right good luck this year so far. The dubious part is that the record unquestionably received a boost due to the fact that the tune was a cover of an Elvis Presley song, and Stafford's vocal style was a close replica of Presley's. The impressive part is that when it peaked at number three, every other spot on the top five was held down by the Beatles. While this was the apex of Stafford's career as a pop artist, he enjoyed some success after pivoting to country. In 1973, he released the LP, Say, Has Anybody Seen My Sweet Gypsy Rose?, which notably contained a cover of a cover, Big in Vegas, originally penned by Stafford as Big in Dallas in 1969, and rewritten by the great Buck Owens for his album of the same name. The LP also contained Stafford's version of Amarillo by Morning, co-written with songwriter Paul Frazier, which would go on to be a signature tune for legendary country artist George Strait. Unfortunately, aside from a few late career singles, the LP constituted Stafford's last hurrah as a recording artist, and he died of liver failure at home in his beloved Amarillo in 1996 at the age of 54. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.